because once you have this, you want to make sure that your supplier can cover it. The last thing you want is a supplier who makes a promise he cannot keep. Then you're in trouble as well. It's like being supplied by a bankrupt company. So there's no, there's no guarantee. Your guarantee, yeah, there's a guarantee, but if the company's bankrupt, there's nothing he can do. So you, you better make sure that uh, uh, it's, it's like you're lending money to somebody based on his credit rating. There's no guarantee he'll pay it back, but what you want to make sure is that he has a very strong balance sheet, a strong business with good cash flow. Same thing with supplier. Uh, sorry. One, two. There's a lot of So the risk is actually on the customer. The risk is on the customer. Yes. Yeah. How do you ensure that? How do you ensure that? Yeah. You make sure you get a reliable supplier. You you have many suppliers to choose from. Make some. Make sure he's got a strong balance sheet. Make sure it's a credit worthy supplier. Not there. Anyway, there's 30 to choose from. Or 31. Actually, how do you ensure from the fault? That's what I'm asking. How do you insure? Well, you could go to an insurance company and get insurance if you want, but that will make it more expensive, right? Yeah, Is there a retailer of last resort? I mean, ask this question there is, another way. There is a, a retail of last resort. You pay a premium over the spot market price, which can be very volatile. But this scenario that we're talking about is for our customers, the big customers, right? But our COA, the vision of the PIRA, would be down to the household level. What would it be like if it's the household level? Um, when it's down to the household level, uh, I call that chaos, <laughs> right? Because imagine if I have a supplier and I'm going to you, and I say, OK, I'll sell you electricity, very cheap, and I'll give you a free TV. Yeah, that's right? not exactly happening in New Zealand. Somebody exactly. Somebody told us. So exactly. it's very transparent because we will tell you the price and they would even say you get a free iPad if you switch from us. Exactly. So I would be very suspicious if somebody offered a TV when I'm trying to buy electricity. <laughs> right? Then I, then I would look at his credit rating. And in fact, there was a bankruptcy very recently in England. It's about uh, a year ago or six months ago. Those types of regimes typically have very standard retail and last resorts that can be, nobody gets switched off because somebody goes back to this. Yeah. Uh, I had a different question. You said that on contract, like one of your customers was 25 and one was last. What, what are the ELC, the latest ELC rulings, um, had, had limitations on the length of retail, um, retail contracts? Do you think that? That's sensible? No. Um, I, I, I think it should be the customer's choice whether he wants a long-term contract or not, right? The guy who contracted for 25 years was a very shrewd customer, very, very large. Um, he knew what he was doing. He contracted at a time when there was oversupply in the industry, and so he's very happy with a 25-year contract with very low prices. And so he is essentially Planning is production, it's a manufacturer. That's, that's a fixed price contract? No, it's, price. A, it's, a, it's linked. It, you, you typically will not get a fixed price contract unless the cost of the producer is also fixed. So normally it's indexed to the fuel. Uh, that's one thing to be very afraid of. If somebody gives you a fixed price long-term contract, but his costs are linked to a fuel, because the moment the price of fuel goes up, he goes back up. So, not a very uh, prudent thing to do. Like yeah, gambling. thank you. Accommodate you to three more questions. Any more questions from the audience or comments? Sorry. We are at DPDP, we are also interested in electric cooperatives. And electric cooperatives are franchises, so you can move. <laughs> and that's there is some legislation. And one of the uh, things that we're looking at, uh, apart from the IMCs, is our call. Yeah. So 
electric operatives, it is really the black hole in the Philippine uh, power scene. So uh, if you, if, if Arcoa goes down to perhaps 500 and 250, then some of the big customers of electric cooperatives can qualify. Yes. It's one way of breaking the monopoly of electric cooperatives. Right. What is your perspective on that? Well, I think whether you, uh, you're dealing with open access customers, we, we have customers who are From the inside the franchise of co cooperatives, and, and we, we've sold them power to open access. Uh, I think the problem is not that, uh, aside from the stranded contract issue, what, which was discussed earlier, the big issue with the co-ops is that there are many different kinds of co-ops. There are 119 co-ops, 120 co-ops, and they range from very well run to poorly run. There are even a couple of co-ops where they're Revenue is less than their cost. Okay. So. Uh, I thought that that was the rule. No, 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 not necessarily. <laughs> so the the problem is really that you know whether they are given the rates enough of a rate margin to run the utility efficiently. The second is, do they have the governance to run the utility efficiently or, or does it become a rent-seeking form of venture, you know. Uh, there are some co-ops we have, you know, we have the third biggest utility in the Philippines in Davao and there are co-ops that have more employees than us. More employees. Yeah. Um, right, and, and the other is do they have the technical capability, technical financial to run it well. You need all three and, you know, maybe out of the 120, uh, Co-ops out there, maybe a third are run well, efficiently, etc. There, there are some in the middle of the group, and there are some that are, I don't know, I would say even hopeless in some cases, like the one Marawi. Dr. Clarence, first and last, you mentioned earlier about one third is in the open access right now, so there are still two thirds that are outside it. So. What are the impediments in moving them towards the DRO? Okay, the ERC one. declaration, the next declaration is June 2018. And so the 750 threshold will be lowered to 500 kilowatts. And so there's another batch of questions. So it's a legal uh, impediment. There's not regulatory, legal. yes. It's a leg uh, well, regulatory. there's a report legal and, and the ERC regulatory. And it, it seems that it's only voluntary. The idea of the regulator before was that it's mandatory so that you get a very active market. The problem is that if everybody is mandated and have no choice all at once, it creates a lot of chaos. At least with um, voluntary, nobody's forced to do what they don't want to do. So the, actually the customers being subsidized don't have to switch to open access. <laughs> The gist of the Supreme Court case is that the ERC mandated right, the, the, uh, the switch or the, the cost of the Yes, but the way the ruling came out is that the Supreme Court effectively gave a TRO on the ruling of ERC. The problem is that the ruling of ERC contained five or six different things where the mandatory was only one out of those five things. So everything got hit by one blow. So now the ERC has written to the Supreme Court to say, what exactly did you mean by, by a DRO? What are you, are you mean every, all these things? Can you say so one by one, please? Because the other five things actually are supposed to improve competition. By putting a DRO, you're actually reducing competition. So that's what the industry, the, the RAS Association has written to the Supreme Court, that's what the ERC is asking the Supreme Court to clarify. Yes. So it's like, it's like, you know, you're aiming for a bird but the shot got hit. <laughs> All kinds of animals. A battle box. Exactly. Okay. The, the 
question about the cooperatives reminded me of an issue that we have in the Philippines, which is very different from other markets. Other markets put in place an extremely clear separation between distribution, i.e. the pure wires business, and the supply, the purchase and the sale of electricity to customers. And that didn't really happen here in the Philippines. And I'm wondering whether the lack of separation between distribution and supply is one of the reasons we struggle when we are talking about cooperatives, because they, they mix up the two concepts. They are monopoly suppliers of wires. Those wires aren't moving anywhere. But supply could be aggregated. It could be done very differently. Do you have any views on that? Um, well, actually, the Supreme Court, uh, the ERC ruling um, itself is a controversy because uh, one of the things in the ruling the ERC attempted to uh, invalidate the local res. Uh, the problem is that the local res, the provision for local res, or the permission for local res, actually comes from the law. So it's kind of hard for a regulator to strike out something that was given by the law. So that is one of the controversies behind the suspension of that ruling, the DRO. But do you see, when you're going to compete, say, in the area of a, of a cooperative, do you see any conflicts between the, their distribution versus supply? When you're coming in as a supplier, they have to provide you the open access to the wires. But they know the customer, they know how much he's paying, and they can use the, the sort of information to make the block the competition. Are you seeing that actually happening? Well, that worries us less. But actually, in the Philippines, the incumbent local res has tax benefits relative to suppliers. The reason is that under a ruling of VIR and the ERC, basically when a utility collects VAT from its customers, it only collects and declare and pays out VAT based on what it collects. So if I have if I have 100 customers and 90 customers pay me full VAT, 10 customers don't pay me full VAT. When I pay VAT to the BIR, I only pay 90%. Whereas an RAS has to pay 100%. So immediately, there is a tax advantage of the local res relative to all the other res. That gives him an inherent advantage. Let me just um, share one seeing complaints that we've heard from one industrial customers. So this local rest and then local rest, they said, acts like a taxi, meaning they choose who to supply. Because if the customer, let's say, the low requirement is from just 8 to 5, then it's not that yeah. for 24 hours, then they wouldn't get any offers. So they are forced to get from the supplier of grass resort, which is more expensive. And since ERC mandated them to be contestable customers, they cannot go back to being happy. So what's the more... Well, I think that is why the mandatory nature is being contested. And there are customers who are attractive and there are customers unattractive. The local rest will obviously go after the attractive customer. And the same with the restes, right? Uh, if you were a bank, would you lend money with a history of somebody with a history of 10 bankruptcies? I wouldn't, right? So that guy is now saying that you should lend to me. That guy, I can understand what he means if he's a poor credit rating, low load factor, and he's forced, mandatory to, to go open access. And I can understand that, right? I'd rather, if I were him, I would rather stay with you. But isn't he just a high cost? Customer. It is an unwinding of that. He's basically getting a subsidy. Right? Yes, that's right. And there are a few of those. Right? Any other questions? Um, perhaps from the people from the back? Even though he is within a 
distribution utility? Effectively, yes. By not by going open access with somebody, and then when the contract ends, not not getting a replacement, and therefore goes to supplier blast resort. Usually, supplier blast resort pays WSM plus a premium. It's different for every utility, but in general, they pay WSM plus a premium. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. In the next 10 years, will, will the market be something like this? You have this retail, and then you still have this captive market, and there will still be uh, this spot market. Well, most certainly, it will be that way. What will uh, the things that will affect that the most are how far will they lower the threshold, and whether they will make it mandatory or voluntary. And that I cannot predict. But those are the big, biggest drivers of this. Whether that will happen. So it means Nikita is not yet completely by that time. Well, what do you mean by complete? Because complete is is different in different people's minds, right? If complete means that the smallest consumer can go open access, um, then yeah, it's not yet complete. Uh, but frankly, if you make it voluntary, it will never happen if that's your definition. But if your definition is that they have a choice all the way down to the lowest level, then that's fine. But you know, Moralco is one of the areas that the Moralco is required to provide subsidies to the first. Consumers 100 kilowatt, 100, from 0 to 100 kilowatt hours, I think. And that's probably the biggest subsidy any utility in the Philippines. And so if I were one of those customers, I would want to go open access. I want to stay and get my subsidy. If there are no more questions, uh, we would like to once again thank you, Mr. Vigilante.